Space Foundation CEO, Heather Pringle. Good morning and welcome. Can you all hear me? Well, thank you all for being here today. It's truly an honor and a privilege to represent the Space Foundation at the State of Space for 2024. I'm humbled to join you as the CEO because Space Foundation is the leader in uniting the space community in both collaboration and education. It's been a nonprofit, 501c3, for almost 40 years, and it started small, and it's grown to include world-class leaders such as Rich Cooper, Leslie Kahn, and Danielle Austin, who's running around, and she's helped make the logistics all possible here today. We've also just established a new Washington operations lead, Megan Allen. Yeah, let's give her a round of applause. But we did that so we could better serve you and strengthen your connections with defense, with academia, with the international community, with civil agencies, and the international world as well. So we're not just in Colorado, and it's not just April when you're going to see us. Although you have to admit, April in Colorado is pretty awesome, right? So I hope you get to meet the rest of the team who's here today. They serve passionately 365 days a year with educational materials for teachers and students, unbiased research and information, professional offerings for entrepreneurs and space adjacent industries, and of course, programs that bring together the best of all space. So today is another opportunity to serve as a catalyst for a stronger, smarter, and more connected space community. Thank you all for coming. Much like the Space Symposium, we have a diversified audience discussing an important topic to our future. So you may already know that the space economy is well on track to become a trillion dollar industry within about 10 years. Our excellent panelists will explore the space economy's growth trajectory and pinpoint changes in its composition. Last July, for example, Space Foundation estimated that the global space economy had achieved $546 billion. This represents an 8% growth rate over the prior year, and of course it includes government, civil, and the largest component commercial interests, which comprises 78% of that total. On the government side, the US by far is the largest contributor to the total space economy, combining military and civilian spending at nearly $70 billion. That's a lot to celebrate. The impact of US leadership has really been a boon to partnerships across international borders, burden sharing across public and private entities, and ultimately opened opportunities to new entrants. For example, as of January, nearly 105 nations have entered space. And it's heartening to see countries like Albania, Djibouti, Ireland, Oman. And after vigorous internal debate by Leslie's team, we counted the Vatican on that as well <laughs> as an entrant to the space ecosystem. Another key enabler in encouraging broad market participation is technology that enhances access to and from space. Today, 10 nations, 14 companies have orbital launch capabilities, and 2023 saw 212 successful launches worldwide. That's an 18% increase over the prior year, or if you think about it, a launch every 39 hours. To put that in perspective, the year before it was a launch every 47 hours. It's pretty impressive. The US again shows leadership in this area, predominantly due to commercial activities, followed by China and then Russia. 
Launch really lowers the barrier to outer space, literally and figuratively, and we should expect more broader participation across the economy. So implications are favorable that the space market will reach $772 billion by 2027. Some do say a trillion dollars within 10 years. And if I, if I could put that trillion dollars into context, I would say that's the equivalent of the revenue that US hospitals achieve on an annual basis. Or if you stack a trillion dollar bills together end to end, it would reach the sun. It's not just the increase in dollar value that makes us optimistic about the state of space. It's a significant milestone on the path to a mature and diversified space economy with continued tech en enhancements and sustainable infrastructure that continues to support life on Earth. But for all that promise, potential limits exist in our ability to achieve that number. Failed flights, layoffs, delays in production, or even policies can, at best, paint a confusing and unclear picture about the space economy, or worse, it could impede future economic expansion. So we are also deepening our examination of the role of technology, especially in the case of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Over the last year, AI has become a popular tool for numerous everyday uses, from writing resumes to, I hate to say it, my kid's school essay. But this agile technology does have the potential to fundamentally change our life with space. Just think of the 20,736 satellites licensed for future launch by the FCC. AI could be applied to the problem of those large numbers to enhance engineering design, mission planning, traffic management, object characterization, and hopefully for all of us, debris management. You'll be glad to hear our panelists weigh the opportunities and risks that exist in introducing this technology to the unique field of space. Our goal today is truly to foster the environment where we can address these challenges across a range of market sectors and viewpoints. The outline for today will include three panels taking this multidisciplinary approach. First, we'll dive into the state of the global space economy with partners from research, academia, the US and international agencies, then we take a deeper look at the incalcul incalculable game changer space and AI through the lens of industry, government, and technology. Finally, I'll turn over the mic to Megan Allen, our Senior Vice President for Washington Ops, to lead our Space, Man space Matters panel and give us some closing thoughts. We're really proud to be your partner for these discussions and serve the space community as together we shape and accelerate our planet's future. So let's get started. Well, thank you all for joining me here today. Uh, really appreciate it. So our first panel is on the global state of the space economy for 2024. And to my right, I have Harvard, Harvard Business School teaching fellow and research associate, Brendan Rousseau. And to his right, your left, we have the Director of Research and Analysis at the Space Foundation, Leslie Kahn. And we have NASA's Chief Economist, Alex McDonald. And then at the far right, we have the Space Attaché from the Embassy of Italy, Colonel Nello Violetti. Thank you all for joining me. Please give him a round of applause. So I do have a lot of questions on this topic, of course, uh, as you all know, but I'd really like to start with Leslie. How would you characterize the state of the global space economy? I think probably the best answer is growing and promising and dynamic. 
Um, some of the numbers that we've shared in the program, the $546 billion assessment that we did for 2022, I think some perspective that helps with that is that's 10-year growth of 92%. Fairly dramatic. Uh, the estimate that we put at 772 by 2027, that's 41% growth. And that's a very conservative model. So again, so much happening on so many levels, globally, domestically. Um, in terms of our launch capacity, just in 10 years, we've seen growth of 178%. So a mere 10 years ago, we were looking at you know 70 launches and thinking, isn't that fabulous? So I think that's one example of where we're at, the fact that we're seeing more nations understand the value of space, whether it's launching a, a single small sat or looking at how space becomes part of workforce development and an economic driver. So I think that's really the potential of, of what we're just beginning to tap into. So Brendan, what do you think about, let's hone in on the last year. What do you think's sure. changed in the last year? I think we Hello? heard. Can you hear me? Yeah. There we go. Well, first of all, thanks to the Space Foundation for putting this together and the other panelists for being here. Um, I think that I want to echo some of what you said in your intro and, Leslie, what you just said there. I think that the space economy as we see it today has largely been built on uh, a vision that new technologies and new approaches to building those technologies could change life on Earth and also, of course, our future in space. When I look at the last year, what has it meant? Um, where are we in that vision? Uh, something that I think we all want. Um, I think that it was a really strong year. I, I am a recovering um, astronomer, so I want, uh, I still think of things in terms of energy. And um, when I think of the space industry and our vision for it, there's a lot of potential energy there. Um, and I think that in the past year, we've seen a lot of that transfer into kinetic energy, where things are really happening. So. I'm also a recovering economist, so I think in terms of uh, supply and demand. On the supply side, um, as you noted, um, record-breaking year in launch, record-breaking year in uh, satellite deployments. Uh, we're a year closer to really exciting capabilities like space stations, and of course there's growing momentum around activities um, on the moon and beyond. That's been great to see, um, and, and as Leslie mentioned, um, there's a growing pool of uh, interested parties that feel like they can and are interested in participating in what we're calling the, the space economy. On the demand side, um, that's something that we follow very carefully. I, I think that that's extremely important and sometimes undervalued is how does everyone else who's not part of this community and in this room, how do they think about space and what's the value that they see? I think this year especially was an extremely important year. Um, we've seen uh, companies and countries around the world uh, start to lean into the possibilities of space, um, capabilities that uh, were just on a sheet of paper a decade ago, things like Starlink and other um, kinds of capabilities now have become valuable uh, in the eyes of uh, more and more people. In some cases, uh, I think that we're all aware of uh, critical, um, which is crazy to think about how much uh, a constellation that started launching in 2019 has become uh, mission critical in, in really important ways. So uh, big year on the supply side, big year on the demand side. Um, I do want to say that I think it's um, all too easy, especially if we're only talking to folks in this room, to see the trajectory of the space economy and extrapolate it forward and say that um, it's, you know, our boldest, craziest visions of what the space economy can do will come true because progress is inevitable and the challenges we've overcome in the past decade, we will, of course, smash those in the future. I think that we do really have a long and hard road ahead, um, but that means um, that the challenges we solve will unlock new opportunities. So I think it's something we're prepared for, um, but um, yeah, it's been a really exciting year. Sorry, that was a long answer, but. No, that was really uh, interesting. And uh, kind of what you're saying is it's not always a straight direct line all the way up. And so uh, I wanna pull on that string, if I will. And Alex, do you mind uh, bringing in a perspective from your seat as NASA's economist, maybe the interplay between government and industry, what have you seen in partnerships with industry? Yeah, we're, we're still at a high watermark. 
of public-private partnerships uh, at NASA. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting to see how that has evolved. I uh, saw a lot of familiar faces in the crowd uh, who've been on that journey. 10 years ago, public-private partnerships were an innovative new idea, right? And today they are, I would say, the main way in which we are doing some of our most important work, right? Our return to the moon, our development of next generation uh, space stations in low Earth orbit, uh, and our, our basic technology portfolio, right? These are all being done in public private partnerships. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've kind of been on an interesting long journey as an industry, right? I was reflecting uh, as I grow uh, long and gray uh, in the beard um, that our industry is approaching 100 years of liquid fuel rocket flight. Uh, this year is 98 years since the first flight of liquid fuel rocket by Robert Goddard. Uh, and you know, we've seen a, a, a maturation of our industry. And actually, this morning is a wonderful example of that with the successful launch of the PACE satellite. You know, this is a historic new capability for observing the Earth systems that our ancestors would have been in true awe of. And yet, Today, it is simply something we do as a regular course of business at NASA. As with many other space agencies around the world, we developed fundamentally new types of observing the Earth system with absolutely uh, incredible resolution on plankton that we are being able to see from space, algal blooms as they develop. These have economic value. Uh, and yet, it is simply something we now do. Right? That is what a maturing industry, in my mind, really looks like. Um, of course, we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of new capabilities and, and disruptive capabilities, right? Re reusable launch is, is an exciting new uh, development that is now just part of what we're able to take for granted and plan for our, our, our next generation of capabilities. Um, you know, at the same time, it's interesting, uh, although the global space economy is growing, if you look at the BEA numbers, the US space economic uh, uh, kind of share is actually shrinking. Um, when you look at it, actually, uh, the absolute level of, of U.S. growth uh, in, in the kind of space accounts that the BEA tracks has been shrinking relative to inflation. And you say, well, how is that possible? We're clearly seeing a lot more manufacturing. Well, the answer is essentially uh, that uh, satellite communications from, from GEO, satellite TV, is shrinking faster than satellite internet in LEO is growing. And so that's one of the big questions about the future of you know, the U.S. space economy, in my mind, is... Uh, how much uh, economic share of total global telecom revenues can satellite LEO constellations get, and how much can U.S. companies get of that total market share, right? For me, that may be one of the, the biggest economic questions uh, that we have ahead of us. And you're doing the homework to get us that answer? <laughs> Well, thankfully, NASA does not have responsibility for okay. uh, low Earth orbit <laughs> telecom satellite constellation US record. competitiveness in that area. Um, but actually, we are deeply tied to it, right? Uh, right. The, the success of, uh, of those constellations feeds our overall economy. Uh, and as we rely more on public private partnerships, right, the success of the companies in these adjacent spheres has a direct impact. So what we are doing the homework on is understanding the, the greater uh, interactions between the market segments. I think before we used to really treat things like satellite telecom as almost another industry, right? You would go to the satellite conference and you'd go to uh, space symposium and you might not see as much overlap between those types of conferences. But in reality now these, these market segments of the overall space industry are becoming more and more connected and we need to understand these connections more when we do our government activities. Oh, thank you for sharing that. So, uh, mostly a rosy outlook, uh, but Anello, where, how do you see it from an international perspective as the space attaché? Well, um, thank you for this opportunity, first of all. Um, if uh, you don't mind, I would like to speak a little bit more about Europe, so I will just like um, end a little bit of Italy. So, um, you know, as you know, we are like in literally uh, changing a little bit the approach and uh, we started, you know, we have visa, we have this collaborative approach, we pretend to have a collaborative approach with the, among countries, among member states, you know, that uh, uh, we have this principle of the fair return for the um, investments and it's a little bit different from US. Um, Late in the recent years, we are um, witnessing plus to um, a much more interest of the EU uh, into space sector. 
So um, uh, they, um, you and DISA, now they are starting to work each other uh, much more. Uh, for sure, much more than in the past, and um, you know, ISAM now is much more an, um, a qualification and validation authority for uh, you. Um, if I, you know, I'm, I've been living here for um, almost two years and a half, a little bit more than that, and um, um, now I can start to see some differences, some um, weak points. At, that's my um, personal point of view. I want like just. Um, I don't want to, to, to go to be too much disruptive, but as, as what I see, uh, in our uh, um, continent in Europe, we are still, our industry is still too much dependent on uh, the government. Uh, many times, it's too much, it's too often um, the space is considered like synonymous of uh, government spending in, um, in Europe. So, in, Still, still is that is like that, and um, the private sector that we see here um, is and the private investment they are not able to really um, have this huge jump yet in Europe. So we are a little lag lagging behind, and we have still like I think a little bit of a lack of um, uh, upstream activities in compared to the US. Um, some um, technology transfer, we are a little bit late, and um, also the, um, you know, some upscale funds are like, uh, not enough. Now, and plus, we are like having some, um, um, I would say, among nations, some internal strategy, each one is, wants to have its own sovereignty in the space, like in um, special um, national strategy, that sometimes is a little bit slowing down the process. Now, uh, and I think we are witnessing, everybody knows here, the, a, a very unprecedented, uh, unprecedented, I think it's the right way, in English crisis in Europe, um, especially for the, in the launcher sector, as, as you guys know. We are like, uh, you know, we talked before, uh, you just said, we are launching um, 200 and something in this year. Well, um, it's all from other countries. So, you know, we are like, we, we are really, we don't, you know, that we have this problem with Darian 6 now, uh, waiting for. We have uh, technical issues with the Vegacy. Um, we have, you know, we are like um, still trying to find a way to go out from the crisis. Now, uh, I, I, I cannot be completely, um, don't make me wrong here. It's like I see some uh, hope, I have some hope for the future. In fact, um, if I look in 2024, uh, now I see that things are changing. And I think things are changing because actually the, the same governments that start to work together like back again, uh, because they now they see that the world is going, they start to, you know, especially in the US, uh, they're starting to increase. Uh, that's a uh, keep going, and we are lagging, lagging away. Well, we are was wasting time. So um, we have uh, this new, I would say, uh, speed from the smaller company, especially launching company, um, that um, we are uh, we are seeing. Um, there are many from Germany, from um, uh, the same France, and uh, from Italy, and also Spain now. And I see. I'm sure that 2024 will be kind of a changing paradigm for the uh, for the, the the launching for the, this kind of crisis that we are in Europe. So the same Marianne Six, I think we are going to we be back again. The Avio is like working this failure. Uh, we are testing the um, most likely the the, the prototype of Space Rider. Um, there, there are things that are happening, and I think one. Not, mm, biggest and interesting uh, thing that's going to happen is like the European uh, uh, space law that we are like thinking. So it's a way to unify and to have a global vision uh, as Europe. But I think it's uh, it's only way to really face this, uh, this timing. So the first question, the state of space in Europe, that's from my point of view, uh, we are likely to be stuck, but I'm sure 2024 will be the new, the, the year in which we can start again. Oh, that's really interesting and, and how you highlighted the interdependence uh, between the countries and that's kind of a theme that you brought up, uh, Alex, as well. So um, with this kind of an outlook, what might be some potential barriers or impediments to 
what we want to go forward with or what will uh, keep us stuck and uh, not allow us to move forward. So I want to kind of just open it up. And I know, I know Brendan's going to jump in no matter what. But uh, Leslie, you want to take it? There you go. Well, I think I'm probably um, in, in the most neutral position to maybe state the obvious. And that is all of our projections, all of what we hope and envision for the future really is dependent upon economic and political stability. So I think that's really um, the foundation. And the more that is disrupted, the more that changes not only what happens on Earth, but how well and how rapidly the space economy can advance and the type of development that we all see. So I think that's probably the first. And uh, I will yield to Harvard for more expertise, <laughs> or to Mr. McDonald. Do you want to go on? No, after you, Brandon. I, I, I think it's a great question that we don't think about enough, uh, the challenges around continuing to grow the space economy. Depending on the lens that you take, I think the scope of those challenges um, and the number of them changes. The way that, uh, that we think about it is we think of this whole uh, commercial space movement as um, a shift from a centrally controlled enterprise in which the government determines the who, what, when, where, why of everything to one in which uh, the government is allowed to play to its strengths and market forces are allowed to play to their strengths. I think sometimes it's conflated as, oh, we're going from government to private. I don't, I don't think that's um, really the case. Um, so it's a shift from uh, a centrally controlled economy to one that involves market forces. There's lots of challenges to that, but thankfully, We've had um, market forces for several hundred years now, and we've got some experience uh, dealing with them, and we know what challenges come up. So we think of it as a three-step process. Um, the first step is you need to, to tap into the efficiency and innovation of markets. You need to create a market through decentralization. So you need to give uh, the private sector the opportunity to take on the challenges that it can and make sure there's real competition there. Uh, the second step is that I think as we all know, markets are not perfect. We know that um, intimately in our daily lives. And uh, certainly as we create um, and allow market forces to come in more, you're gonna have market failures. Space debris is a great example of uh, a very hard market failure to solve. So is market power and market concentration, something that's increasingly becoming part of the conversation here. So we're, we gotta deal with that to make sure the market works well. And the last thing, I think something that we don't talk about as much, um, but that will increasingly need to, is um, even if you create a market and you, you refine it so that it works really well, um, there's no guarantees that this market will work for us. Um, markets are engines um, and they have no conscience of their own. They do what you create them to do. So we need to make sure that um, it does what we want it to do and that it's, it's fair and just and um, brings us to the kind of world that we want to have. Um, that's just our perspective. Um, if you're interested in more, we got a book coming out that takes that. So <laughs> ask me about it later. Well, those are those are good points. And even with uh, you know potential impediments, what we saw in COVID was remarkable resilience. So Alex, do you see that type of resilience carrying forward, or do you see it being more affected in the future? Yeah, no, I, I think the, the COVID experience did show that we do have pretty remarkable resilience. There, there, were, there were mission effects, right? I, I think uh, we don't want to paper over that. Um, but the teams continue to build satellites, uh, ones that went out to asteroids, right? Um, very, very significant resilience within our workforce, even when there's some significant challenges. Um, you know, I, I think, reflecting on, on Leslie's comments there about the consistency, um, and, then, and then also on kind of Brendan's comments related to the market, you know, one of the things that uh, keeps me up at night is how we match uh, consistent demand signals with um, reasonable expectations of the future. Because obviously every market segment would like strong government demand signals. We'd all like strong government demand signals for everything we do, right? And yet, potentially, based on growth trajectories of federal appropriations, um, we may not be able to forward all the demand signals that we want. And so how do we balance those things, right? How do we create consistent demand signals? Because any one of these industry areas will require many, many, many years 
right, to develop. How do we coordinate the demand signals from the different parts of the federal government uh, in a way that's consistent for long enough to give industry a chance to develop new capabilities, sometimes fundamentally new capabilities that may even be disruptive. Um, and that's, that's a challenge, right? You know, the, 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 federal, the, the Fed, right, the Federal Reserve, it, its, main, um, its main knob is interest rates, right? Well, we, don't, we don't have interest rates, we don't uh, lend money uh, out at NASA, we, we, we pay for things or, or, or give it away in funded space ad agreements. Um, but what we can set are expectations. And I think sometimes we have to maybe do, uh, do more, uh, more coordination on what are good expectations to have as an industry, because our expectations are, are literally infinite, right? Our expectations extend out to other planets around other stars. Uh, but that's probably not an FY24 goal, right? Yeah. So where, where are things in the middle of that? And, and, and I think um, we've had an incredible period of optimism uh, in the industry, when you when you look at the venture capitalist community, right, they're they're starting to signal that um, you know availability of capital is not where it was even three years ago, uh, and that is changing the dynamics, right? Still very high compared to where we were ten years ago, so it's still a boom time in that regard, um, but we're off that peak. So so how do we adjust our expectations as a community um, based on these changing dynamics? And I, I think that's something we still need to spend a lot of time talking about. That's a, that's a really good point. And Nello, I'm curious, are you seeing that small shift in change in uh, demand signal from a European perspective? Do you still see opportunity for new entrants uh, to come into the space ecosystem? What's kind of your view on that? Yeah, for, su for sure, um, new entrants and opportunities, yes. I think uh, we are just starting as I said before. Um, you know, I often talk about, talk about uh, contamination of space, uh, no space sector into the space sector. Uh, it's what basically every day we see, um, especially now in the commercialization of uh, low Earth orbit and uh, uh, the moon um, activity and the Mars and, you know, the, the first community on the moon. Um, well, I, would, I would say that uh, we should concentrate uh, much more on the um, national strength uh, industrial strength of each one, um, and to create this new business, new market, new activities. Um, and I'll go, I'll talk a little bit of Italy, uh, Italy now. Um, you know, we are well known in the world for uh, uh, fashion, for food, um, for automotive uh, companies. So I just would like to recall for, uh, for fashion, for example, the agreement that we have done uh, between Prada and Axiom, uh, that's a completely new business, basically. Uh, we are like starting to um, uh, build that, uh, you know, to design, build the, um, a, a spacesuit for the astronaut for Artemis III mission. Um, if we think about the Axiom 3 guys, crew that are like coming back on the, on the Earth tomorrow, should, they should let, I guess, um, they are um, wearing right now the spacesuit that we have built in Italy also, a uh, very technological one. Um, we have just uh, in December we have um, done this kind of uh, agreement with. Uh, basically it was before, but actually we announced the agreement with Axiom uh, between Axiom and these uh, two iconic brand Barilla and Rana. It seems like you know we talk about pasta in space. Yes, we talk about it's a new business. Um, we cooked like three kilograms of uh, Barilla Fusilli. Um, that it's completely different from the one that you can find in the supermarket. So it's like, the, uh, as you know, uh, you know, another was was approved, but still, it's a new business. So Barilla and you know the guys from Rana, they decide, okay, just start to make this new business space, and let's let's talk about automotive. Um, you know, we have Dallara, this very um, uh, interesting uh, company that they make uh, um, some specific and technological products for. Uh, um, motorsports and they, they use a lot of composite material and they're very good in that. They made an agreement with um, SpaceX, with Elon Musk, and the, as you know, we built part of the uh, Crew Dragon um, and the same, uh, the Elon Musk itself, thanked, uh, you know, in 2020 when we had this first um, travel to the ISS with the, with the Crew Dragon, thanks to the, this company for the uh, incredible work they did with the, their stuff. So uh, my my answer is yes, we are just starting this new business and we have a lot of opportunities, I think, especially now. No, that's my... Oh, yeah. Glad to hear it. Can, oh. can I just say Absolutely. that 
I think if we all know that there's a chance to wear a spacesuit by Prada and then to eat barilla pasta, uh, who wants to go to space faster now? <laughs> so I think some of that is awareness. Um, and that speaking to awareness, I think one of the other things is that we, we don't get to tell that story well enough. I don't think we're connecting the dots. Um, I don't know how many of you noticed this morning, but in the conference room right next to us, they're doing a program on climate change, air pollution, and children's health. I mean, three fundamentally important sure. questions. What I don't think there's an appreciation for is that we understand those three things so much better because of what space and the satellite industry does to help inform that data that leads us to that. Well, Leslie, uh, I do my part every time I get in an Uber, and I talk to the driver about uh, why space. And last night, Freeman was really excited, and he's going to look up the Space Foundation. <laughs> but I think uh, maybe we'll run next door and, uh, you know, uh, mob. Yeah, let them know uh, in on the conversation. So I hate to shut down this great conversation, but. Um, I'm curious if we could do a little bit of a lightning round. Um, is there anything that you're really watching uh, as exciting to happen in 2024? Or is there a key enabler that you want to contribute that we haven't really touched on yet that's important for us to tackle in the future? And I'm going to run down the line. Brendan. Oh, sure. Well, since I'm going first, I can do the easy one. Uh, Starship, I, I think that's the biggest story going on right now. Um, I don't think we even really realize if and when that comes up and is really starting to accelerate um, everything that that'll change. I, I think that looking back 10 years from now, um, we'll be surprised how much it changed things. Um, and we'll be surprised that we were surprised going forward. So is that confusing? Sorry, kind of. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> So I think it's definitely Starship. Uh, I think it's also DARPA's Luna 10 project and what the United Kingdom is trying to achieve in terms of satellite and launch. Um, and I think one of our speakers who will be up here later, uh, Patricia Cooper, who is just, if you watch Space Matters, you know that she and the other panelists are just routinely insightful and brilliant. And in a, a program we did earlier this week, she, I think she really encapsulated where we're at because she said, we're right on the cusp of like the Jetson space era. We just have to make sure that, that there's the proper framework around that. But uh, I think she really summed it up. We're, we're like this close to the Jetson space era. Uh, so I'm gonna choose two. Uh, I think uh, one of the most important stories is uh, the return to the moon with an international coalition. Um, I, I think that is just so deeply important to our future, to uh, encouraging international cooperation on this planet at a time where that's particularly needed. And uh, we've, of course, got Artemis II uh, coming up here in the not-too-distant future. And, of course, that has an international element. We know that uh, America is going to be proud, but uh, Canada is also going to be proud. And uh, Canadian Americans who happen to work at NASA will be particularly proud. Um, and, of course, we had, uh, we, we had also a really important milestone with the UAE uh, contributing a gateway, uh, an element to the gateway, an airlock. I, I think that's been kind of underappreciated. That is the first non-ISS partner who has committed now hardware to the ISS program. A deeply important step in expanding that coalition. I know our Italian colleagues have uh, have have thoughts as well on 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 what kind of HAB systems can contribute as well. Lots of other people also part of that dynamic. So our international element, I think, is really what is so different about this return to the moon. And then finally, I have to just also say, uh, follow this year Europa Clipper. Uh, I I have long. I remember literally biking around my neighborhood in Ottawa when uh, Galileo had discovered the differential uh, motion rates between the interior of Europa and uh, the ice surface system when we knew that there was uh, large potential water and thinking that that was the coolest thing that I had ever heard of. And here we are about to uh, send a dedicated mission to Europa. I could not be more excited. 
Absolutely. Yeah, as I said before, I'm really watching in Europe what's going to happen in the launcher sector with the, these small companies. Um, I'm sure there will be some changes this year. Um, but if um, you ask me to just name of a company, I, I just I, I'm not doing any publicity here. But it's like I'm very um, proud of. What we, I was working with a company in of Italy. I'm not saying the name. They're working with this. Um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, new launcher stuff, like we, we, we are we thinking about the new uh, air launch capabilities that we're like um, thinking. We started um, some years, you started some years ago, actually with the Virginia Orbit. Now maybe we are going to do the um, next step. Um, so because my previous experience as test pilot, I just, uh, I'm really watching very, uh, very closely these guys and uh, I'm looking for, um, you know, this new launch this year. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining me here today. Let's give them a round of applause.